All right, this PowerPoint presentation is the continuation of primate behavior. This will correlate with chapter six in the explorations textbook or chapter seven in the essentials textbook. So let's talk first about primates and their acquisition of food. Like we mentioned in the primate classification PowerPoint, one of the defining features of a primate is dietary plasticity or diversity in diet. So most primates will consume a wide variety of food, anywhere from vegetation to fruits to nuts to insects. Some, some primates even eat small amounts of meat. So depending upon their dietary plasticity, the variety, wide variety of foods that they consume, this may also affect how far they travel in a given day. So we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, depending on the quality of food, the search for adequate food resources can occupy over 50% of a primate's waking hours. Especially females with young will have high nutritional demands since they're not only supporting themselves, but also their offspring. The three factors that will affect a primate's ability at acquiring food are quality, distribution, and availability. So quality is discussing essentially the caloric value or the quality of the food. So food sources like vegetation and fruit tend to be lower in calories, whereas food sources like nuts, insects, and meat tend to be higher. Distribution is referring to how the food is scattered across the landscape. So depending upon the time of the year, a primate need, may need to travel a farther distance in order to gather and acquire adequate food to support the entire group of primates or troop. The availability is referring to seasonality, uh, especially when we're talking about fruits and fruits and vegetation. Some fruits may be available during some seasons and not during others. So that's when the primate group would need to switch food resources. So these three factors will, all, will also affect a primate group's range. So a primate group's range is referring to how far that primate will travel in a given day in the, in the search for adequate food resources. So if you envision for a moment that we're back on campus, if all of our food resources are located on campus, we have enough food resources to support our entire troop, then there's not a whole lot of motivation for us to travel much farther than campus. Uh, because the more we travel, the more calories we burn and the more food we need to consume. But let's say all of a sudden there's a resource shortage and our food is scattered all across the city. So all of a sudden we now have to expand our range in order to get adequate food resources for our entire troop. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the notion of, of culture amongst non-human primates and also self-medication. The notion of non-human primate culture can be considered somewhat controversial. Most primatologists do agree that primates do present convincing examples of culture. Uh, but it's important to note that not all scientists necessarily agree that non-human primates possess what can be considered or qualified as culture. Uh, famous primatologist Jane Goodall was amongst the first to assert that chimpanzees possess material culture. She very famously observed chimpanzees fishing for termites. And as simple as that might sound, you'll see in some of the video clips, it's actually a very uh, specialized skill. It takes a lot of, there's a lot of learning and um, modification of the twig involved. It's not something that the chimpanzee knows how to do automatically. They need to learn it from their elders, usually their mothers. So very famously, after Jane Goodall observed this, Lewis Leakey said, we must redefine man, redefine tools, or count chimpanzees as man. Because prior to Jane Goodall's discovery, it was thought that only humans were capable of culture. So other researchers have also observed related behaviors in both captive and natural settings. So let's start by first defining what is culture, what qualifies culture. So some of the definitions out there, use and alteration of objects as a form of material culture. So altering objects found in the natural habitat, such as twigs, rocks, leaves. Um, you know, there's, there'll be some examples of Japanese macaques washing sweet potatoes and using hot springs. So I want you, when you're watching the video clips for your discussion this week, I want you to really think about each example and if you think it qualifies as culture. So are they modifying the environment to enhance their survival and or reproduction? And is this a learned behavior? Essentially, are they born knowing how to do this behavior or is it something that they must learn from the elders in their group? So is this behavior passed down to offspring? 
So these clips here, these are all in your module. Um, I'm not going to show the clips here in the PowerPoint, but the, they are all provided in your module. And it will be important that you watch all of these short clips to, to complete your discussion for this week, the primate behavior analysis discussion in your module. So these are all very short clips. They're under, most of them are about three to four minutes, but you're going to watch multiple examples. You're going to look at hammer and anvil use in capuchin monkeys, which are new world monkeys. You'll look at hammer and anvil use in chimpanzees, which are apes. You'll look at termite fishing in chimpanzees, which are apes. Um, this next clip down here is going to show you various examples of apes using tools. There's an example of hunting and meat sharing with tool use in chimpanzees. These two examples here are Japanese macaques. So there's one example of Japanese macaques in hot springs and another example of Japanese macaques doing a behavior called sweet potato washing. All right, self-medication. So essentially the idea that primates can use, non-human primates can utilize natural um, sources in their environment to, to, to cure an ailment. So there'll be a few examples for this one as well. There's a self-medication in lemurs example. So they're using millipedes uh, as a source of um, insecticide, but one of the side effects is it gets them high. So it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, there's also a video clip example of self-medication among capuchin monkeys. They're using piper plants also as an insecticide. And then also an example of alcohol use in vervet monkeys. And there is one more example in the module that is charcoal use in red colobus monkeys. So there will be four examples on non-human primate self-medication in your module that will also be important for your discussion this week. All right, let's talk a little bit about communication. So all primates will vocalize. These vocalizations can vary anywhere from very soft vocal vocalizations to very loud vocalizations. So just like you might predict, these soft vocalizations are for transmitting information over short distances, just primate to primate. And the louder vocalizations are for communicating between groups. Vocalizations have various functions. They can indicate the emotional state of the primate. They can give listeners information about the world around them. So they might vocalize to indicate a predator or a food source. So this can also be very altruistic. We talked earlier about altruistic behaviors. If a primate vocalizes to alert the entire group to a predator, that's altruistic in the sense that that individual primate is potentially putting him or herself in danger because they are vocalizing to call attention to themselves. Uh, this, you know, of course, they hope that they can also escape, but this vocalization um, lets the entire group know of a predator. So, for example, if we're all a group of vervet monkeys and I let out the alarm call for an aerial predator like a hawk or an eagle, then all the primates then know to go down in the canopy to avoid that aerial predator. Or another one of you may, may let out the vocalization for a terrestrial predator like a leopard. And then we all of a sudden know, okay, we need to move up in the canopy to avoid this terrestrial predator. Primates also vocalize to identify food. So they're not just out to get the food for themselves. They want their entire group to know, oh, hey, there's a great patch of fruit over here. I want you all to take advantage of it. So vocalizations do have clear patterns similar to human language. Primate vocalizations may be largely pre-programmed. However, primatologists have noticed that innovations in sound can occur. And this is another form of evidence for culture. Vocalizations amongst one chimpanzee group, for example, may be different than the vocalizations amongst another. Vocalizations can also serve to name and identify food resources, monitor political landscapes within a group or even between groups, and also reinforce dominance hierarchies and social bonding. So there's some other clips in your module this week. This clip here is going to have you, when you go to that clip, you're going to start at 110 and watch to the end. It's going to give you an example of multiple species, all vocalizing to prevent predators. So these are all predator warning calls. So these are various old world monkeys, Gwenins, Diana monkeys, Sudi mangabees, Colobus monkeys. And one of the really interesting things about this is they're all able to communicate between species. So a Gwenin lets out an alarm call, and it also benefits the Diana monkeys, Sudi monkeys, Colobus monkeys in that particular area. There is also an example of a false predator alarm call among a capuchin. And I don't want to give too much away, 
But I want you guys to think about why would that capuchin let out a, far, a false alarm call. So think about that when you're watching this clip. All right. So we mentioned that another one of the defining characteristics of a primate is high levels of parental investment. Uh, primates do have prolonged gestation, so longer prenatal period, that's conception through birth, and also prolonged postnatal. Primate infants are born very dependent upon their mothers for survival. Um, we know that monkeys raise in captivity that do not have contact with their own mothers, usually don't know how to care, do, do not know how to care for their own infants. So this caregiving is oftentimes learned from child to parent. Uh, males often intervene in disputes that involve their own offspring. So it's not only the mothers that are invested in the survival of their offspring, it's also the fathers, depending upon the primate group, of course. All right, let's talk a little bit about sociobiology. So the field of sociobiology is, well, one of the aspects of it is it will examine non-human primate behavior as a possible model for early human behavior. That term, that term hominin just means early humans. Um, chimpanzees and bonobos are very similar genetically and live in very similar environments. However, their social hierarchies are negotiated in quite different ways. So chimpanzees tend to have social hierarchies that are established through male aggression and dominance. And the high ranking males tend to have increased access to mates and they tend to have increased access to food resources. So chimpanzees tend to be a little bit more brutal and violent. They have more complex dominance hierarchies. Um, bonobos have social hierarchies that are established through sexual encounters, and females are often higher ranking than males. So they essentially use sex to mitigate tensions and to negotiate their dominance hierarchies. So there's another clip that you guys are going to watch. It's, it's a little clip from a documentary called Why Sex? And it's going to actually compare and contrast the studies done by Richard Rangman and Amy Parrish. Richard Rangman studied chimpanzees and Amy Parrish studied bonobos. And it's going to allow you to analyze these two species that are extremely close, very genetically close, also living in similar environments. However, they have a social ecology and reproductive strategies and dominance hierarchies that are negotiated in very different ways. So I'm going to have some study questions for you guys in the module that's going to have you analyze why this might be. Why do these two very closely related species behave in very different ways? And what are some of the evolutionary implications of this? So some other species that have been utilized as possible models for early human behavior are various species of savanna baboons like Hamadryas or Gelada baboons, uh, mainly because savanna baboons live in similar similar habitats and also organize their groups in a similar way as early humans. Um, chimpanzees, of course, and bonobos are 98% identical to modern humans and share other similarities such as tool use and competition for social rank. So sociobiology begs you to, to ask yourself that question, essentially what determines behavior? Is it more about your biology or more about your social environment or your physical environment, or is it a combination of all of these things? So here's that clip that you're going to watch from the documentary, Why Sex? It's going to compare chimpanzee and bonobo behavior, dominance hierarchies, uh, the way that they negotiate their rank, and it's going to have you compare and contrast. All right, so encephalization, so this term increased encephalization, we're talking about increase in brain size proportional to body size. So modern humans have a brain size well beyond what is expected for a primate of similar body weight. For example, a chimpanzee, modern chimpanzee has a cranial capacity somewhere between 300 to 350 cc's, whereas a modern human has a cranial capacity five times that, somewhere between 1200 to 1700 cc's. So there were some evolutionary trade-offs here with an increased brain size and um, a narrowing birth canal. Childbirth became much more dangerous and complicated for humans, especially once we get to Homo erectus and onward. Um, as, as we've learned, one of the adaptations to being bipedal is our pelvis has overall become more broad and bowl-shaped. However, the pelvic, pelvic inlet where the baby's head would need to pass through has become much more narrow. So we have this bipedal locomotion, 
that's advantageous for many reasons. However, childbirth has become more dangerous and painful. So along with encephalization, so we're seeing as cranial capacity expands, we see things like increased reliance on material culture, uh, more social, more evidence for social complexity, the evolution of cooperative hunting and, and the use of tools while hunting. And this is all, there'll be more to come on this in all the upcoming chapters on human evolution. All right, so in non-human primates, the most rapid period of brain growth is slightly before birth. And that's, you know, goes along with that wider birth canal. In humans, um, our, the brain size of a developing, developing baby essentially is somewhat limited in utero. It's limited during that prenatal because if baby's head gets too large, then it will be more and more difficult to pass through the birth canal. So in humans, the most rapid period of brain growth is actually the first five years of a child's life. So that's why when you see a toddler, a two or three year old, they look kind of top heavy. They look like their heads are growing at a faster rate than their body, which is because they are. Um, of course, the body eventually catches up. But, you know, for a human infant, the most rapid period of growth of the brain is going to go from age zero to age six. Um, this, so there are restraints on prenatal growth in humans. This is necessary to allow for the infant to safely pass through the birth canal. All right, so a larger brain does have a metabolic cost. So when we say metabolic, we essentially mean that that large brain needs more calories to support it. So we have extremely high caloric demands, especially females that, that are supporting a developing fetus or females that are supporting children that are very young. Primates also need a complex brain to be familiar with their home range. So things like knowing where the food sources are, where to gather food, being aware of the seasonality of various food sources, also the complexity of all of our social interactions and dominance hierarchies, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a hypothesis called the social brain hypothesis that proposes that primate brains increased in relative size and complexity because primates live in social groups. So it was essentially established and maintained through natural selection. So this larger brain size and increased, increased intelligence levels allow for us to keep track of this complex web of social interactions, competition with other members of our group, alliance formation with members of our group, and also maintaining those alliances and friendships. All right, so that's the end of the primate behavior PowerPoint presentation that correlates with chapter six in the Explorations textbook or chapter seven in the Essentials textbook.